Okay, let's get started. And then go to the next slide, Joanna. Hello, everyone. Very nice to see you today. The Go Open National Network is presenting OER, Identifying and Remediating Bias, a professional learning session around OER to engage all learners. Today, we'll have some quick intros, uh, an overview of the Go Open Network and OER, in case you're not familiar. And then I'll be handing it off to Joanna and Christina to do our, our learning today. And we'll have some time for questions uh, at the end if that things come up. Great, so let's do our intros. If you haven't put your name and affiliation location in the chat and you're comfortable doing that, please jump in. We'd love to know who's here. And uh, Joanna, why don't you go first? I'm not hearing you. I was double muted, uh, everyone, sorry. Uh, I'm Joanna Samizzi. I'm a professional learning specialist at ISMI, uh, a high school biology teacher on the side as well. I teach students who have severe and profound disabilities and are in a separate setting classroom. Um, and a continuous learner about identity bias and how our resources, especially our OER resources, can be evaluated, interrogated, and remediated. Um, and I'll pass it to my dear friend, Christina. Thanks, Joanna and Amy. I'm Christina Spears. I use she, her pronouns. I am an education consultant with ISKME. I'm a special education teacher by trade. Um, I do a little bit of adjunct professoring, teaching around adolescent development and specific um, differentiation for unique learners. And somehow I managed to be a PhD student in my second year studying educational leadership and cultural foundation. So I'm excited to share space and learn with you all this afternoon. I'll kick it back to Amy. Thank you, Joanne and Christina. I'm proud to be uh, an ISKMI along with you all uh, and the work that you are doing to bring educators along using OER. I've been with ISKMI for 17 years, was one of the uh, first uh, founding creators of OER Commons back in the day and have uh, formerly uh, was VP of Research and Development, and currently senior advisor at ISME and also the facilitator of the Go Open Network. And if you're not familiar with ISME, we're a nonprofit based in Northern California and we have developed OER Commons as a digital public library and infrastructure for collaboration using open educational resources. We really work towards making education uh, improve more broadly using open education towards making learning experiences open, participatory, and equitable. The Go Open Net Network is now a national community-led uh, effort with K-12 educators and leaders that are really committed to bringing open education to the classroom, to districts, to states, and the whole country through knowledge sharing and collaboration. We're offering professional development opportunities like these webinars, and we're engaged in strategic action uh, around practice and policy to spread the impact of open education, especially in the K-12 landscape. Go Open started six, uh, seven years ago as a federal initiative under the Department of Ed's Office of Ed Tech. And in 2022, we went to a community-led model to offer membership to individuals, to anyone that can join, and started the Go Open Hub on OER Commons as a centralized place for sharing. So we're really glad to be able to host uh, many uh, experts and educators in the field that can bring more experience to you all around open ed.
just on the definitions, you may all know what OER stands for Open Educational Resources. And the qualities are that those materials can be shared, reused by anyone without having to ask permission and go, going beyond the uh, restrictions of traditional copyright and cost. Things are openly licensed, freely available, modifiable, and shareable. All of this is in, in the name of equity and as empowerment to educators and to learners to be able to reuse and contextualize materials. A lot of what we'll be talking about today. And around this uh, freedoms for materials to be used in new ways brings benefits to both educators and learners. Educators have more uh, investment in curriculum, can know their standards um, better and create materials that really fit their classroom. They can more easily bring materials up to date to stay relevant and contextualize and customize materials specifically for their students' needs. And this results in students seeing themselves reflected in their learning and becoming more engaged. These are really amazing benefits that we advocate uh, for the use of OER. And I'll hand it back to you, Joanna and Christine. Thank you. Uh, we wanna start today with a land acknowledgement. We begin by acknowledging that wherever we are, we are on traditional lands that, were, that are served by indigenous peoples. We want to honor America's birth people and all elders past, present, and emerging. We are called on to learn and share what we learn about the tribal history, culture, and contributions that have been suppressed in the, tell, in the story of America. If you haven't um, yet, or if you're in a new spot and you're not sure which lands you're on, you can use this website, native-land.ca, uh, to find your lands. I am at the Boston Logan Airport, and um, this airport is on the land of um, these nations, the Naumkeag, the Masa'ata, Chus'ethe'ek, and the Pawtucket. Um, so we want to acknowledge the lands that we are on because it's a big part of um, the, the story of what comes next and who we are acknowledging. Anytime that we work with our students and we get them to think about where are we and where are we going to go. Um, today, when we dig into the idea of identifying bias, we're going to, we've chosen to use climate education as an example of how OER can be uh, examined and remixed to um, help our students identify, help them be part of identifying bias um, in resources and uh, work as educators to make some choices about what we're gonna do about the bias that is in many of our resources. Um, and a lot of times it's bias that we might not see. And that's why sometimes using students and letting them have a viewpoint of, hey, whose voice is centered in this work? And whose voice isn't talked about at all? And is that on purpose? Or um, is it by um, perhaps lack of knowing that that voice is important? So we'll use a climate education resource today to show how openly licensed curricula can further support inclusion, diversity, equity, and access um, by remixing. We're going to look at how adding place-based learning, looking at the culture of the land where students live and impact of students' actions. And of course, this is just one example of how this can be used in all different um, forms of OER. So we know that there are lots of other lenses um, that this work applies to. Our big goal today is to use inquiry uh, to let you do some of the work of identifying bias. What do you see? Um, and to connect with each other and collaborate. Thanks for sharing in the chat. Like Christina said, thank you, Sam um, and Amy and Christina shared what land they're on. Um, and you all shared in the chat earlier the work that you're doing around um, open education, copyright librarian. Uh, we have a professional development technical advisor focused on OER and EdTech. 
an OER to, I love that, Dan, uh, a consultant, uh, outreach and technical assistant network leader, uh, an education researcher and program evaluator. So really glad to have you all here as we go through this. So first we're gonna, I'm gonna um, let Christina say a few things before I share this link to the resource with you. Christina, what do you wanna kinda add as we like lay the foundation for what we're doing today? I think I'll say, even though we're in the Zoom room, right? Bring your whole self to the space because um, we are talking about identity and culture. Um, part of our identity is our place, literally where our bodies are on this land. We have acknowledged the stolen land. Um, so I encourage you to bring that part of your identity. Like when I talk about who I am, I always say I'm a Black woman educator. Like I bring all of that with me. Bring your big questions here. Like I love how y'all are already putting things in the chat so feel free to use the chat to ask questions to stop me or joanna as we go through this because it is about inquiry i'm probably going to pose some big questions here to you and we really want to dig into it i'm from an appalachian holler speaking of space we say things like get in the mud right like oh, it's going to be messy it's going to be inquiry so we invite y'all to bring all of that into the space and i'll recognize you know we only have a little bit over an hour so sometimes us academics and educators like to get real in the mud but we're going to do the best we can together to make meaning of some things. I think that's what I'll say to kick off, Joanna. Thanks. So if you're following along in the slide deck, and I'm going to put that link um, in the chat box again in case you didn't open it, because we have a few links, a few places for you to go together. Um, so first is the link to the slide deck. And if you have that open, we're on slide 10 and we're clicking on this link to a climate change and water resource. And so um, this is the link to the climate resource that we'll start with. And many of you are used to doing this work. We're looking at resources. Um, and so what I'd like for you to do is we're gonna take just five minutes for you to um, get a first pass on this resource, right? Do a quick skim top to bottom, maybe find one part of it that seems to be calling to you and go ahead and start by in the chat box, just noting what are you seeing? There's no right or wrong. Um, you can say as much or as little as you want, but we are gonna give you about five minutes because um, we want you to see and not see some things in here. Um, so I'm going to go on mute and um, set a little internal timer for five minutes. If you want to um, turn your video off while you look, that's cool too. We're gonna kind of come back at 21 after the hour.
taking about one more minute to look at it and sharing what you see. Uh, one of the things that I talk about all the time is how do we make the invisible visible? How do we take your metacognitive process, what are the things that you're thinking as you look at a resource, and how do we make that visible for other folks to see? So help us. Um, because you're going to see different things in a resource than anyone else in the world, because you have different experiences than anyone else. And so maybe you have a really strong technical writing experience. Maybe you have a really strong design experience. And so when you look at this, you see all the design features of it. So um, at this point, we'd love to have um, maybe two folks unmute and talk and share for about a minute each about what you see and everyone else. Share in the chat box because we want to know what you see. So about two people to unmute and share. Hey, Dan, I'm excited to see what um, you're sharing with us. I think you have to change your sharing settings um, for us to be able to see it. Um, but do you want to unmute and tell us about it? Yeah, hang on. I'll change the sharing settings. Thanks. Anybody else? What did you see? Well, one thing that I'll say is that if people aren't wanting to talk about the resource, then maybe it was a little dull, right? As I read through this, I was like, this is very technical. This does not get me super, and I'm a science lover, and I'm a climate education passionate, but it doesn't really like hook me in any way. Um, anybody else feel that way about the resource? Okay, did anybody um, notice the licensing on it, right? If we're talking about OER, is this OER? Like if we want to start to make some changes, we're like, hey, this, this really isn't, it's good information, but it's not really exciting for my students. It's not going to reach them as individuals. Um, anybody want to help us? What's the licensing on this? Can we remix it? Uh, thanks, Dan. Dan's going to get us there, right? The idea of remixing and like, where is water near you? Where can you find water, right? Sam and Sonia both say, mm, the licensing isn't entirely obvious. And um, mm -hmm, yep, Sam, and, and the important part, right, is that word generally. Yes, because if you um, scroll down um, to the very bottom where we might usually find licensing. We see that this is from the USDA and the Forest Service Department. Um, so we know that they're generally in the public domain. Um, this resource is on OER Commons. I purposefully didn't give you the landing page of the resource. I just took you straight to the resource, um, but it has been identified as public domain. So we can remix it, right? That's awesome. Except if you're familiar with OER Commons, there is no remix button on here. So I can't easily remix it because it's a PDF and um, it wasn't put onto the platform as an open author, but I can, I have the legal rights to remix it. So 
I can combine this with some other things. I could take screenshots. I could copy and paste some of the pieces and put them in a new thing. And yes, how, what do we want to do with these resources? How do we really want to get students excited about um, water? Uh, we want to be able to have them look at where the water is near them. Dan, you were saying zoom, zoom out of the image, zoom into the image. Click on it and zoom in. Yeah. And see the people down Tell us below. more about this. Oh, wow. Yeah, tell us more, Dan. This is awesome. That's Minnehaha Falls. It's, it's a it's a waterfall on Minnehaha Creek, which runs a block south of my house. It's in the inner city of Minneapolis. And it's one of the, it's part of the St. Anthony Falls, which is the only waterfall on the Mississippi River. The big falls portion of it is upstream about four miles in downtown Minneapolis. But this is our little residential yeah. section of the falls. My point in sharing it is, of course, to locate my experience with you and to uh, give you some hands on activity to do about experiencing, it, which is what um, which is what an, an OER uh, should be able to do um, is to have students be able to do something with it. I apologize for not getting the share setting right going out of the box, but that always happens, of course. <laughs> you get, and that's the thing about OER. You, you make a mistake and the students will fix it for you. So you, that happened today. And uh, that's what I tell uh, teachers, that you better get used to being, uh, making a mistake because you will and your students will fix it for you if you let them. It's the beauty oh, of Oh, I love this. Yes, yes. And that is really when we talk about um, cultural relevance and responsiveness and being culturally sustaining to who our students are. Um, that's why OER is key, because we need to be able to change this to make it make sense to them. Um, so that is a big part of what in our work we want to encourage is first, like, who are my students? How do I get them in this content? Um, and that's a big way to do it. So um, how could we add place-based localization, right? And so, Dan, you like teed us up exactly. Who are my students? Where do they live? How do they connect to this content? And often, how can they kind of create and identify that themselves? Christina, I know you have some experience doing this directly with some classrooms up in Maine. Do you want to talk just a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I want to add to and deepen what you and Dan just did because it was perfect for what I've done in Maine with some educators. Um, I just want to sort of reiterate the why of Joanna named cultural relevance, cultural responsiveness. We could say DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Some people say IDEA, JEDI, whatever you want to put in on why it's important for us to bring our full identities. As I said to the beginning, is it's important to connect students' identities to their lived experience. Like Dan said, locate my experience with you. That was a beautiful phrase, Dan. Like our students should have the opportunity to do that as well, right? With within the curriculum, within these OER resources, within our instructors. Um, I'm really thinking a lot about identity right now in curriculum. I'm in a curriculum theory class. So we're talking about identity and place and space in the curriculum. Um, and Joanna and I were at a conference several weeks ago, and Christopher Emden spoke about the word identity. And he said, if we go to the root of the word identity, I-T-Y, that um, end of the word, I'm going to lose my English teach the name for it, the I-T-Y at the end, the, not a, a suffix, I guess, um, stands for place, 
community, right? City, it stands for a place or a location. The I is me and the dent. So where I'm located, dense makes an impression on me and who I am, right? And how do we use OER resources to do that with and for our students, right? So that's the why. Y'all know it's important, but I had to hop on that soapbox to make sure we were clear, right? But And the how, we're going to give you a tool before you leave today and give you the opportunity to grapple with a tool on how. But I like to ask questions, um, right? So we have a good question posed, a couple good questions. How and my how and why might we add place-based localization? Dan already did that for us. He put a picture in the chat immediately. He said, let me make meaning of this climate thing with this falls that's just south, a block south of my house, right? How might we localize our resources? What if Dan put that picture up first thing instead of that PDF that Joanna showed, right? Or what if we just went outside with our kids outside of the school and said, locate yourself, now, what resources do we need to learn, right? That's a totally different thinking and we can do, use OER to do that. So some questions I'm gonna pose here and then again, you'll have a tool in just a bit is where do I live and learn? Thanks, Dan, for sharing where you live and learn, right? Where do you live and learn? This is for us as the educators and these are questions we can pose to students. What is my relationship to land and nature and the earth, right? If we're talking about climate change and everybody has some relationship to the land, to the earth, to how climate change impacts you. Let's talk about that. Um, back to our land acknowledgement, right? What does climate change and water look like for me? How do I have access to water? That's part of what that resource was talking about in my community. How might I contribute? to climate change. That resource didn't directly say climate change is, in, is caused by people, right? But we do. How, do. how do we cause harm to the earth and to nature, right? Um, so all of that to say, those are some questions I posed to some educators in Portland, Maine. They have, were working on a unit on land and culture. What is the connection between land and people culture, right? And they were working with fourth and fifth graders, in this unit and it was really student led the students were asking the questions but Joanna if you click for me here is sort of um the topics they wanted to explore and you can put in any topic right so they had geography and mapping and you know the land literally what does the land look like how does it form how did it form over time specifically um post-colonization in the united states right again back to our land acknowledgement there were invasion of native territories literal native lands that's part of history and culture right and these were just the topics that they were throwing out and then they said well christina how do we do this with 10 and 11 year olds right so i said let's look to their identity and where they are and how they move about the land and so they asked an identity question what is my relationship with the land and earth then they wanted to ask a connection question that regardless of who you are or if you're near Minnehaha Falls or you're in Portland Maine in the ports right what benefits do we experience from the land and earth then they wanted to ask a question around justice because I said we do harm they said, how do I cause harm to the land and earth? Or how do I contribute to harm against the land and earth? And then finally, we wanna be able to take some action. We're not just out here teaching fourth and fifth grader stuff without wanting, you know, giving them the skills to take action. So they asked, how can I take action against climate change, i.e. harm to the land and earth? So when they were posing these questions, they might look at an OER resource and say, how do we look at this resource and answer those questions? How do we get out a south of block south of our house. I'm going to keep using Dan's image to drive this here, you know, and answer those questions with that OER resource sitting maybe with my feet in a waterfall. So this was their land and culture unit and their motto became because they were going outside all the time. They were localizing this as simply just going outside, outside of the classroom and taking their resources out there. And their slogan became lay your ass in the grass. Now they didn't say that to the kids. That was their PLT slogan, right? But they were really about getting outside with children. And then it turned into a sea and culture unit because they studied the earth, the land, but they're at a port. So they wanted to study the sea also and port culture and things like that. So then it became put your feet in the peat. And they always went out into the peat marsh to get connected to the earth, to indigenous practices, right? But also to make their resources work for them. 
So that was way more than I think the seven minutes Joanna told me I had on that slide. But that's the like, why this is really important. How do we think about identity and place and where we are to remix these resources to work for us and our students? I'm going to pause there for questions. I see Dan put something else in the chat or just thoughts or reactions before we share the tool with you. Or you can throw tomatoes. Critiques are welcome too. <laughs> so um, I kind of did exactly what Dan is doing, right? Like, so next, our, our students are curious and we're curious. Well, okay, so what does this mean? And how do I learn more about this? So um, I had done that as well. And I looked up a watershed near me. So now I'm gonna give you this resource. And this is where we're going to start to see some things, right? So put on your really close interrogation um, glasses because um, there's, there's some things hiding in here, right? And so um, this is a watershed near me. And this resource was created by a, um, a local university. And I did reach out to them asking permission to use it. And they, although they haven't given it an open license, they said, yes, so you can use it in any way you want. Just give attribution. So we'll give attribution to the UNC Charlotte Center for STEM Education and Urban Institute and Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And now I want you to see what you can see in here, because there's some interesting stuff hiding in here. As we start to share information and help our students find information, we have to make sure that they are good interrogators of this information. So let's take um, three or four minutes here and see what you see in this resource. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sam. Sharing the things that you're seeing. Fill that chat box. See all the things, right? This is our job as the guides on the side, um, whether you're guiding educators or you're guiding students, our job is to help see the things. So what else do you see? We've got some good stuff showing up in the chat. Yes, yes, keep it coming, keep it coming. What are you seeing?
Yeah, anybody want to unmute and tell us more about something that they wrote in the chat box or something else? It's okay if there's background noise, like don't be afraid to unmute, right? I'm at the airport. There's all sorts of background noise that is, I think, mostly getting filtered out. But we'd love to hear from you all. We'd love to hear your see voices if, if you can, if you're in a safe place. See if that link will open up for you. Um, Dan, I'm actually going to hold on opening that because I want us to stay right here for now and, and look at this resource before we add a new one. But yes, let we will get to it. Um, when we can. I, I want to hear some folks' thoughts on, on this resource before we add something else new, but thank you. Yes. Hello, this is Sonia. I noticed that there's an action plan type of box at the bottom. Yeah, tell us why, like, why did that stand out to you? Or what, what do you think about it? Tell us more, Sonia. Let me click back over. Um, what can you do to protect our creeks? And it gives several options like prevent soil erosion, use a car wash, not your driveway, report pollution, that type of thing. Yeah, and do you think there's anything kind of like hiding in there that it pings your brain of like, hmm, I like, how, do I need to reframe this with my students? Is there anything about that that you're like, hmm, I wonder. Um, I mean, I think, I think you could easily take that information in the box and build a lesson on that, connect it to a standard in your curriculum and build a lesson on that to teach students more specifically how they can protect watershed areas. Absolutely, because for some of our students, these might be things that they see and work on at home, right? Maybe they, um, maybe they do car washes that, or you know, they wash their car at home, or maybe they currently put fertilizer on their grass. And so this might be a way to really um, let them look at like themselves and start to bring themselves. Um, I see. I think it was Jeff. Jeff, are you in a place where you could unmute and tell us more about your noticing? Sure. Yeah, they they go through kind of extensive um, lengths to talk about the Scottish background of the naming of things up above. Um, but then actually, interestingly enough, after I posted my comment, I looked down below and they, they do finally make note of there being that many Native American artifacts have been found, but they don't go through the same trouble to maybe provide information about the names of the peoples that you know, originally inhabited these areas or, or where those artifacts came from. Um, so, you know, they really, they do acknowledge that it's talking about the white settlers, but it, it, it's, you know, not acknowledging that there were people there before. Um, so I, I noticed that. I mean, obviously a, a little bit framed from where we started and some of the things that we did at the start of the session, but still 
um, that was a helpful exercise for you to be looking through that lens. Yes, yes. This is one of the big things that I noticed too that like set off an alarm bell for me um, because I actually live here and I know that um, Yadkin PD, that's actually, that is an indigenous tribe name. Um, and so is um, the Catawba, right? Those are the names of some of the indigenous um, tribes and nations of the area. So I was like, oh, whoa, what a missed opportunity. And what an interesting aspect that they chose to take time to talk about those names. Um, and so what we're gonna kind of do now is start to really realize that sometimes there are some hidden biases, right? Um, and this could have to do with geographic location. Um, when we talk about identifying bias, and in a few minutes, Christina is going to take you through the tool that we have created, but um, certain aspects of geographic location and who lives where and why do they live where and how do we demonstrate positive identities for people who have been historically marginalized. So, um, Dan, or, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff, yes, I like, and someone said 100% Christina was like, yes. So, um, Christina, take us, let's, let's take a minute and do we want to just look at the geographic setting indicator or do we want folks looking at the whole tool? I say we can give a few minutes like we've done to maybe look at the whole tool while encouraging folks to maybe hone in on the geographic setting since we're talking about place, but maybe some time to take in the whole thing before we go back to the tool and the geographic setting one. <clears throat> so I think we'll give folks maybe another four or five minutes. Joanna has been keeping us on time to take a look at the entire tool for identifying bias. And this tool was jo Joanna and I and a team of really great, um, diverse, culturally responsive educators came up with this tool when we came across resources that did have some hidden bias, that didn't meet the needs of our students. We said, what questions? Remember we said this was about inquiry. What questions can we pose when we're looking at a resource to then be able to use it or not, but hopefully it's OER and we can remix it. So take a couple of minutes, four or five minutes, Joanna will keep us on to look at this and then we'll come back and really look at the geographic setting part of the tool.
So our plan is to send you to um, breakout rooms in a little bit so that you all can talk to each other. Um, but first, we wanted to, um, you know, get your thinking collectively as a group, see if there were any questions, anything that is really standing out to you. Um, and so we'll take about one more minute and then Christina will, and I will kind of take some questions. We'll talk through geographic setting and location in regard um, to that resource a little bit and then send you off to have some time to, to dig into this, trouble with it, wear it, try it on. Um, so think about one more minute, if you've kind of gotten lost in the bigness of the tool, maybe just look at this geographic setting and location identity. Um, Okay, come come at us with your thinking. Make your thinking visible to us. What are you seeing, wondering, troubling with, curious about, excited by? You can unmute. You can um, talk in the chat box. Uh, Sam's got a great question. Christina, do you want to um, talk a little bit about if some identities are more important to look at when it depends on the subject matter? Yeah, that's a great question, Sam. Maybe one of my favorite ones to trouble with with this tool. Um, so here's how I approach this tool looking alongside resources. I, because 12 is way too many, right? Is that how many is on here? Yeah, it's way too many to look at, right? For your brain literally cannot do it. So I first go in thinking I'm only going to choose one or two, right? Because we can't change the world. Rome wasn't built in a day, right? So just choosing one or two, and I choose the one or two based on how it relates to the subject matter, right? So we're looking at a climate change resource. We're trying to localize it based on where we are. So I'm going to look at geographic setting and location. That just makes sense for this resource. Now, I could add a layer to talk about race since Jeff named um, that our indigenous peoples were overlooked, right? So maybe I look at geographic setting and race, but that's probably it alongside this resource. A another example I'll give you is I've looked at a To Kill a Mockingbird resource a lot when we're looking, there's a really good one on OER Commons that we look at a lot. And I often go to race and class for that one because it's just what the story's about, right? So if I'm interrogating that with students, then I'm going to look at those two categories, and I usually don't go beyond two. And I'll say whatever feels good to you and your students, right, if we're really being culturally responsive, is what is going to be responsive to us and who we are, how we're making meaning of this curriculum and this text together. And that's the beauty of OER, right? We can remix it and use it how we want, and this is an OER resource, right? So all of that to say, lean in in whatever way feels good to you and your students responsive to where you all are. Nada, or Nada, I'm sorry, I should have asked you how to pronounce your name. Yes, we're glad to have you. Um, we'll be sure, I think Amy will send out the recording and the links later.
other things that you noticed or saw or wonder about before you go talk with um, what some of your peers instead of just us? Did anybody make it to the last page? Christina, this last page was a, a, driven a, a lot by your thinking and actions. Do you want to kind of talk us through this before we send folks to a breakout room? I sure can. So this came up in really just the in, the initial thought as educators that we want to do no harm, right? We don't take an oath like doctors, but I think all educators believe in our teaching and learning, we should not be causing harm to students, right? Um, and sometimes we come across resources, you know, if we Google them or go to that teachers pay teachers, which y'all don't, you know, or sometimes we'll find things on OER that could potentially be harmful to the students that we serve. And, you know, there's always permission to throw a thing away if it is too harmful, if it's unremixable in your, so we were like, sometimes we throw it away. Sometimes it could be a remixable thing. Sometimes it's good from the jump and I don't have to do anything with it. So we wanted to create kind of a flow chart to visualize the thinking of for teachers or educators when they come to a resource. Is it causing too much harm that I can't do anything about it? reject it and keep looking in OER Commons. If you're not sure, we're going to check the licensing and all of those things um, to see if we can remix it with our students. Maybe I just remix it up front to get rid of that harm immediately without even putting it in front of my students. Maybe I only use parts and pieces of it and not the whole resource. You know, and if, like I said, if it's a really good resource, I'm moving kind of from right to left here. Um, if it's really good on OER Commons because it's been remixed a couple of times, it's been used with this tool, then maybe you present it to students and have them ask some really critical questions like we've been doing here today. So this is really just a guide to or a visual to demonstrate how you can use the tool to decide, do I keep a resource? Is it remixable? Do I work with my students? Um, Etc. So that might be helpful as you go into breakouts um, and talking about that process for you is at how do we come across an OER resource and do what's best with our students. Yes, and this can be really important. I got a chance to open up the other resource that Dan had shared in the chat about students being part of the creating of what meaning is important to them. And so before we send students out to find things, we might want to build some tools for them to help them start to evaluate a resource. Can they identify bias in a resource? Um, do they need some support? Do they need me to show them how to do it and then they can do it? Um, really, really great things to think about. Let's see, we um, have planned for folks to go to um, breakout rooms. Becky, um, are you up for going to a breakout room? Sure, I can do that. Okay, great. So um, let's see. I think um, if it's okay, I will hop in with somebody and Becky can hop in with somebody. We'll kind of trouble around it a little bit um, and we'll come back in about 10 minutes. So let's see, I'm gonna open the breakout room. And um, it is set so that other folks can share their screen. Um, just make sure that you have that link to the tool open. And um, I'm going to open the rooms and we'll come back in about 10 minutes.
Okay, I brought everybody back. So it, it'll be just a few minutes, a few seconds for um, Becky and... Um, hi, Becky. Hi, Sam. Okay, Becky and Sam, um, you want to take a few minutes and share what you guys talked about, and then I'll let Dan share what we talked about. Sam, do you want to talk or would you like me to? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking a lot about the tool um, and the idea of, of doing no harm. And from the teacher's perspective of how you know what all of the context is for a student. So for me, I was a classroom teacher for 10 years before I moved into administration and then started working with administrators. And as a teacher, you didn't always get the context with what was going on with your students, right? So if, if a student was struggling with self-image issues, you didn't necessarily know that unless they came to you and, and talked to you about it, or you saw signs of it, and then you were talking to the counselor about it, or the counselor came to you because the concern specifically dealt with something that was going on in your classroom. So to put a resource in front of a student that may trigger a negative response in that student, you may not know. The intention would not be to harm the student, but it may do that anyway. So. It got us talking about being aware of the fact that there are things going on with students that we don't have the insight into and trying to figure out the avenues to discovery for that. And one of the conclusions was that we need student voices when it comes to determining the best instructional resources for students. I think that is the unheard voice in our instructional materials. Sam, please add context. Um, please don't let me just speak for the two of us. Sorry, I had to <laughs> mute myself. That, that's great. Thanks so much, uh, Rebecca, Becky. Um, yeah, I, I. that's a great summary. Yeah, that the importance of like, um, of student, voices and um we also talked about like how do you uh sort of i guess it intervene when conflict arises because there will be situations where like like once you know there will be like individual sort of like discomfort like for example like um i just i'm just speaking from like my own experience i've heard as a librarian like you know, some in some cultures, they don't feel comfortable talking about mental health. So when like we're studying in class doing a search, for example, on like mental health um, and students, like, you know, there would maybe like some students that um, won't feel comfortable for you to kind of use that example. But there will be other students that, you know, you know that, you know, they that would be helpful for them to see that kind of examples. So how do you address those conflicts? I think it's very tricky. Yeah. Teachers and instructors need support. And another issue is like if you um, kind of put the questions in front of students for them to kind of reflect on, does this resource um, at harm to marginalized individuals and groups, depending on the age level and, um, you know, they may not know where to start. So, you know, because some people, they don't know what they don't know. So I think having that tool is very helpful because, uh, a teacher can kind of provide some guiding questions for students to start with.
Yes, Sam and Becky. Awesome. Christina, do you want to add a few little ideas and then we'll um, hear from Dan? Yeah, I think sort of the instructional pedagogical piece that Sam named around conflict resolution and how do we make sure students bring their full authentic selves while not harming or marginalizing another group of students. We should constantly be asking those questions, right? Um, I think that's really important. Um, what I will name is if we allow students to bring their full self and we figure out together as a community, because here's what I know, by age six, kids might not understand racism or sexism, ableism, fill in the blank, but they do understand when things are not fair or when things harm other people. So how do we use developmentally appropriate language, even with our youngest folks, to sort of mediate that conflict resolution that Sam was naming? And I think pointing our young people like, we don't cause harm to other people. So what can we do differently about that? And, and young folks are willing, their brains aren't as um, developed as ours or aren't as stuck as ours. And they're willing to do that work with us, I think. But I think um, what you all named at the beginning, I think it was um, Becky about student voice, right? Like these Questions might not be appropriate for six-year-olds, but they're questions we can pose on the tool, questions we can pose in developmentally appropriate ways to allow for that student voice, right, which I think is really key. So thanks for raising that stuff, y'all. Um, I think we're going to kick it to Dan, who was in a group with Joanna. What sort of resonated with the two of you in your small group? Well, we, took the, we talked about a couple of aspects of the tool in relationship to the resource that I shared with earlier about the project that I put in the uh, MPCC content. And, um, and we looked at how the, citizen, the citizenship uh, block and the ge geographic uh, location setting block would apply to that. And uh, uh, Joanna noticed some specific things. There's some language that, that, that document is a, a um, newspaper article from the Minneapolis Star Tribune in 1896. And some of the language that's included in there is, is clearly uh, offensive racist language, which uh, sort of pl places act the activity that was happening in those days. Um, I mean, it brings it to the forefront. And I guess as a teacher, one of the things you'd have to have to be conscious of was would there be any students in your class for whom that would be a particular trigger? Um, in general, um, you know, in my experience with the students in my class, because I had both Lakota and Ojibwe students in my class, and typically they would inform me about what was uh, most slanted to them. And they, of course, were more than, more than aware that historically um, bias and racism was present. So understanding how it was in the past and what it's like now is, of course, an issue. Uh, and I brought up, well, this, there's particularly current topics that are connected to this in Minnesota Act happening currently. So you can take this whichever way you want. The other thing about this tool that I noticed earlier was that it's, it's, it's too big. Yeah, I mean, to be you, to be, the question is, how are we going to use it and what sort of resource are we going to use it with? And in what context are we going to use it? I don't, it's not an individual teacher tool to use with a particular resource because it would just be overwhelming unless the teacher needed to do this on a ref, you know, to reference something if they weren't sure about if a particular project or lesson, you know, they wanted to check it, they could use this as a checklist to go through stuff. And, and it's also, I think, a useful tool if a team of teachers is creating content or curating content, um, it beca but it's, it's too big to, you know, to be practical for a, for, a, for a teacher to use on a regular basis. I mean, you, you would open this up and go, no, I can't deal with this today, and then close it down again and go back to what you were doing if you're a teacher, because you just wouldn't have the time to read through all this. So that was one yeah, of the Yeah, Dan, options. let me add on to that because um, part of what you got to is actually one of the most important things that we always want to name when uh, introducing this tool, uh, which is that the tool is intended to be used in a community of practice, just like you said. So 
that the, we are sharing this tool with folks today to kind of offer the tool, um, knowing that for many folks, like this isn't a tool that you would use all 12 identities on, as Christina said, on any resource, right? But um, rather that you would seek out a community of practice, that you would select a, a resource that you know is like super valuable to dig into. Um, you would identify one to three identity markers, right? When we looked at what Dan offered, he and I said, well, maybe we look at religion, faith, and spirituality. Maybe we look at family and home life. Um, and then Dan, as you mentioned, like as teachers use this part, what we noticed when we run we run series that are about six to eight sessions, 90 minute sessions to use the tool and how to build automaticity so that after, you know, six to eight sessions and time of really feeding yourself and reflecting and nourishing your thought process and building, like Christina said, those pedagogical strategies in your own self, it starts to become a little bit automatic, right? You don't always have to, Dan, like you said, you don't always have to even open the tool because now when you, you know, once you know, you can't unknow, right? Now, when you look at resources, all of you might even start to just always look for, is there any geographic location bias in this resource? Um, is there any bias about language? Does the source present English as the only perspective? Um, so that's part of the goal of this work is, um, you know, how you can start to build automaticity. And like Becky and Sam said, there are other even identities that aren't necessarily listed on here, but the more you know about your students, the more you can start to look for those things in the resources. Um, I'm going to pass it to Christina to, to kind of do some last words and, and close this out. Um, before I do that, I do want to put the link. If climate resources are your jam, um, you can join this group where we share climate resources and collaborate. Um, but Christina, take us, take us home, finish us up. I really appreciate Dan raising that point. It is probably the most, one of the most important points we raise when we share this tool is to do it in community um, and over the course of time, not just pick it up one time with one resource, but to build that automaticity. And we started with identity, with who we are, where we literally sit in the earth so that we need those perspectives, right? When we want to make this less harmful, when we want to make this more culturally responsive. So it is really important to do it in community. And that's why we also started with inquiry, right? Asking people questions, starting with a conversation. Really the tool is um, just supposed to kind of set that off, be a starting point um, for educators to do what's best for their students. And I'm actually gonna end on what Sam put in the chat is that that flow chart at the end, which is really, again, visualizing best practice, things teachers, educators we know to do, is a really good starting point for teachers and students, right? Like how powerful, to Becky's point, would it be to put a resource in front of students and to interrogate it with them, to pose a question or two or three from the resource, right? Or to exactly how Dan started us off, getting out in the world if we're doing climate and nature get out in nature and do that with your kids and put resources with it so I think that's how I'm gonna end is um take you know we say get in where you fit in take what you need right so and it's remixable we are talking about OER resources so that tool is overwhelming I can name that as one of the authors of it so take what you need remix it and write it in a way that's developmentally appropriate that's culturally responsive to you and your students um and I will say as one of the authors like hit me if you come up with something really cool or you come up with another way to visualize this you and your students that's a reason why we wanted it to be open is to see all the many iterations of what's possible when we remix um, OER resources I appreciate folks taking the time to learn. Joanna said we're continuous learners. Thanks, Amy, for opening the space and folks for hanging on in the Zoom room. Thank you so much, Joanna or Amy. Any about two and a half minutes. Well, big thanks to both of you and everyone that was joining the call. Joanna and Christina, you have certainly been amazing spokespeople for the tool and how comprehensive it is and everyone that collaborated together today that 
brought such thoughtful consideration and application of the tool to students that you know are in your context and uh, the thoughtful uh, prevention of harm to your own students has been really inspiring. So I would close with that and just put on the slide to be able to reach us and get in touch, stay in touch with myself, Joanna, the Go Open Network, our social media on LinkedIn and Twitter, joining our newsletter. And thank you all for being here. We will make this recording and resources available at the Go Open Hub on OER. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.